Well, Senator, I want to ask you, first of all, uh, you came to the Senate as, as a protege of Ed Muskie, and I, I'd love to know, I would think that they might have had real profound political differences, but it seems to me that there are some, actually some parallels of character and humor and mm -hmm. um, regional identity. Um, did, did Ed Muskie ever talk to you about uh, Bob Dole? Did you ever, con ever have a conversation? Uh, I, I don't recall any uh, uh, specific conversation yeah. uh, about Bob Dole with Senator Muskie. Uh, I was present when Senator Muskie discussed many members of Congress, mm. uh, and I can recall him including Senator Dole, uh, among others, whom he admired, who he thought was a good legislator, someone mm. he could work with. Uh, I think Senator Muskie had a bias toward those who, in fact, were what he called good legislators. There's yeah. people who actually tried to get bills passed as opposed to making statements and yeah. holding press conferences. And I know he held uh, that view of Senator Dole. How do you define, in your experience, how do you define a good legislator? And, and, and I would preface mm -hmm. that by saying, I think to the general public, this is so mysterious. People have so little idea Mm. Of what actually transpires in the legislative process. It is true that people regard it as mysterious, but the same principles that apply in virtually every walk of life apply in the legislative process. Uh, you establish yourself by demonstrating knowledge, uh, willingness to work, uh, a willingness to respect and listen to other points of view, uh, and be at least as interested in an outcome as in getting credit for the outcome. Uh, I, I didn't want to exaggerate by saying disinterested in getting credit because I don't think that's really uh, true of most people who have reached that uh, level in the political process. Uh, it's awful tough to get things done in the Senate. Uh, I always think of the Senate as a microcosm of the system of checks and balances that the founders wrote into our whole system, that the, that the Senate s separately viewed independently contains internal checks and balances, uh, although it itself is part of a larger scheme of checks and balances. And the way I put it, uh, with only modest exaggeration, is that the, the founders wanted to prevent bad things from happening, and the easiest way is to prevent anything from happening. And uh, in the Senate, that's not quite, but almost true. So it's tough to get things done. It takes a lot of work, intense personal effort, uh, senator to senator. The predicate upon which you build is uh, how you are viewed by other senators, whether they trust you, whether they respect you, whether they like you and like to work with you. Uh, and uh, that's a tough thing to do. It really is time consuming. It requires focus, effort, and the reality is that uh, a very large number of men and women who come to the Senate and leave never devote that kind of effort to it because it's, it's easier to do other things and there are a lot of other demands on their time. It's fascinating. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard Bob Dole say, that in this job, your integrity is everything. Your word is is the end all and be all. Mm -hmm. And the, and and almost as often he said, in this place you can't hold a grudge. Yeah. Now, obviously, you and he found yourself working with people you probably didn't like. How do you yes. do that? I mean, uh, because you have to. Yeah. Uh, 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 the majority leader doesn't elect the other senators. Uh, the people of their states do, and uh, they're entitled to representation whether I happen to like or dislike the person uh, that they elected, and uh, you have to respect them and uh, deal with them. Uh, uh, Bob and I were able to achieve a, a high level of mutual trust and confidence because we shared much of the same, what I would call them, foundational beliefs in that your word is everything, and. Uh, uh, you, you can't carry grudges because your enemy today is your ally tomorrow, is your enemy the next day. You're constantly building coalitions based on different issues, different times, different circumstances, and you can't ever 
uh, afford to be permanently mad at anyone. Do people outside the Senate exaggerate the importance of ideology in terms of, of building those coalitions? Uh, I think ideology has become increasingly a factor in the Senate's deliberations uh, in the dozen years since I've left the Senate. Uh, it clearly has always been a factor. It was a factor when I was there, but I think it has intensified, in some respects calcified, uh, since uh, Bob and I were there. I think it's gotten a lot tougher. There, there's a lot uh, more of the view that compromise is a sign of weakness and that uh, sticking to your position is a sign of strength and conviction. Uh, and I think that loses sight of uh, what real strength is, what real conviction is, and what a real desire to get things done is. Do you think the media reinforces that growing perception? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. It's a, you, you now have this uh, all-out competition between cable news networks, uh, between the media. You don't have daily deadlines anymore. It's minute-to-minute -minute deadline. And there is a constant search for uh, controversy, sensationalism, uh, for uh, uh, a few slogans of a few words that capture a position. Uh, a disdain or for caricature it. a caricature, yeah, or a disdain for nuance, a disdain for uh, uh, reason discussion. It's mu it's a much tougher uh, place now for political leaders. And I must say, in the Senate, uh, I worked for Senator Muskie as an aide in the 1960s. I then served in the Senate in the 1980s and 90s, and there was a huge increase in that. 20-year period in the workload, in the demands, uh, and I think it has continued in that direction. So now senators are besieged as never before uh, by people who want to talk to them, get a point of view across to them. It's the number of issues, the number of visits, the number of things that you're supposed to know and talk about. Uh, I think they've all made it very difficult to maintain some level of uh, collegiality, uh, some uh, higher institutional loyalty over party and personal ambition. Uh, and so I think it's, a, it's much tougher on the individuals now. It's also been suggested that 30, 40 years ago, I used to hear President Ford talk about his experiences on the Hill, um, that basically members of, of both sides just knew each other as individuals, often as friends. Yeah. Um, they would socialize together. They, they stayed in town more. Um, it, it, has some of that evaporated as well, that, that there's just less of the kind of normal social interaction yeah, oh yes. from uh, colleagues? Yeah, it, 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 that, that's been a dramatic change. I can recall when I worked for Senator Muskie, uh, his family would go to Maine for the summer. In fact, I drove his, up with his family frequently when I was a young aide, and he would stay here until the August recess, and almost every night he'd have dinner with a group of senators. Uh, uh, when I was there, uh, we were in session all the time, uh, uh, although one of the reasons I think that Bob and I were able to maintain a good relationship is that we did see each other uh, uh, not socially outside the Senate, but within the Senate. Uh, many, many an evening we had dinner together, either he and I or with a small group of senators in the Senator's private dining room. Uh, and we talked a lot. We tried to maintain an ongoing sense of communication. I can recall clearly that uh, uh, when I ran for majority leader, uh, I made up my mind that one of the first persons I was going to go see when I was elected was Bob Dole, because I knew he would be the Republican leader with whom I'd have to deal. And I did go to see him, and I told him that uh, uh, I regarded this as a very difficult job. He knew more about it than I did. He'd been in the Senate much longer. He'd been in the leadership. I had not been. But I told him my impression and that it would be a lot better if we could agree in advance on certain basic, very basic principles. Uh, uh, I told him that I, I'd never surprise him, that I wouldn't try to embarrass him, uh, that I'd try hard to keep the focus on the issues, and the Senate would ultimately decide uh, who was right or wrong, uh, he welcomed it. He, he was very receptive, had the same views, and that established the basis for what has become a very good friendship 
over the years. Uh, I, I say publicly often now that to this moment, Bob Dole and I have never exchanged a harsh word in public or private. Uh, we disagreed almost all the time on virtually every issue. We negotiated as best we could. We tried to work them out. Most of the time we had to let the Senate decide and sometimes my view prevailed, sometimes his view prevailed, and then we went on to the next issue on the next day. And I take it you feel that there's been a downhill I mean, progress, if you want to call that, since then. I mean, that, that there's not yeah. that kind of understanding, for example, in today's Senate it's between, be between the leaders and... Yeah, it's become much more difficult. Yeah. I, I think uh, uh, in the first place, as I'm sure Bob has told you, will tell you, uh, when you're a leader, you, you have several different constituencies. Uh, uh, the, the members of the Senate from your party is one constituency. Uh, they're not unanimous by any means on almost any issue. One of the most deceptive statistics that's published are, are the figures that some of these uh, uh, publications that follow the, the Congress put out showing how often members of a party voted the same way. But if you, if you dissect them, you see that there are a very substantial number of procedural votes in which all of one party vote one way, all of the other party. If you took those out, it would show a much more diverse uh, view within each caucus and among the entire Senate than is the case. So you've got to deal with conflicting views in your own caucus. You've got to deal with a leader who has conflicting views within his or her own caucus. It's not an easy job, I'll say that. It's not for the faint-hearted or for anyone who's not prepared to put in a heck of a lot of time at it. You, now, you arrived in the Senate in 1980. Yes. Presumably expecting to be in the majority. I mean, yes, I was in the majority when well, I arrived. That's right. Yeah, I mean, right. To remain in the majority longer right. than... Right. Uh, it was a short-lived majority. Well, <laughs> but you regained it. Yeah. What, can you, what do you remember about election night 1980? I was surprised, <laughs> uh, disappointed. Uh, I already knew that I would have a very tough time uh, being elected myself in 82 and that this would make it much more difficult uh, given uh, the change, uh, uh, but mostly it was one of surprise. I, I didn't expect it. I, I don't think a lot of people expect, expected it. If you recall that election, Reagan and Carter were fairly close until maybe a week or ten days before the election when the, the tide suddenly swung and, and almost completely one, to Reagan. Yeah, the one debate. Yeah. Which crystallized. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I think that's reassured right. Reassured voters on the one hand and yeah. crystallized their doubts. Yeah, the yeah. Hand. So uh, I think everyone was surprised, even the Republicans, yes. at the at the scope of the victory. Yeah. So it was a big surprise and I thought, oh God, this is going to be tougher than I thought. <laughs> but now let me ask you, my sense is, from conversation I've had with Senator Dole. You know, that night was a real turning point for him. Mm. And it wasn't that he was irresponsible before and responsible afterwards, mm. but that once you're in the majority, you have no choice. Yeah. You, or you, I suppose you have a choice, but basically you can, you can legislate, yeah. however difficult that may be. You're the you governing can, party. Exactly. You're the governing and party. And you're no longer governed by press release. That's right. And, and That's I mean, right. you've been in the majority, you've been in the minority. Yeah. D describe yeah. the difference uh, it's psychologically. A, it's a huge difference. The truth is it's much easier to be in the minority. It's much easier to get cohesion among your colleagues uh, than it is when you're in the majority mm -hmm. uh, because you know that your position is not going to prevail on many issues. Uh, and really what you're doing is presenting an alternative to the position of the majority. Uh, uh, so it's very tough, very tough to go from the minority to the majority. Do you have, in a sense, more room for political maneuver yes. in the minority than you do in the yeah, majority? Yeah, sure. And I, I think that's true of most democracies. I don't think that's unique to the United States. There's much about the American political system that is unique. It doesn't exist elsewhere. But in that respect, uh, uh, I think that's true universally. In fact, I think 
opposition parties, which is what they call themselves in most parliamentary systems, do it more overtly, more directly, and not self-consciously. In this country, it, it, it's somehow viewed as a pejorative to say we're in the opposition party. Here people think you're in the minority party because the American political system uniquely requires a blend of competition and cooperation. But there's no universally accepted standards or rules or code of conduct for determining that. We have that in a judicial system. We have rules. We do have it in sports. We have it in business. In all walks of American life, we like competition. It's the toughest in the political arena because there are any rules. There are no guidelines. There are no standards as to what is proper, what is improper. When does competition become inappropriate? Uh, and so it's awful tough on the leaders because you, you sort of make the rules as you go along and you define it not so much by writing out and publishing a set of rules, but you define it by your conduct. Do you have a theory as to why legislative leaders, including highly successful ones, <coughs> are at such a disadvantage in running for the presidency? Because you have to compromise. And, and uh, I remember uh, Bob Dole, who I regard as a close friend who I greatly admire, when he ran for president, he was being criticized in the primary contest because he had compromised while he was a senator. And it was a pejorative. It was a negative argument. He shouldn't be president because he compromised with the Democrats while he was the Republican leader in the Congress. That argument being made to the party base. Yeah, the party right, party. right. That yeah. it's somehow you, 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 you sold out. You don't have any conviction. You're not strong if you reach a compromise with these evil guys on the other side. Uh, it's tough. The other reason is, of course, you've got this enormous legislative record. You voted on thousands of things that can easily be taken out of context. Uh, you recall when Al Gore and Bill Bradley ran against each other in the Democratic primary in 2000. Uh, they, they were so similar yeah. that they were reduced to arguing about votes that they'd cast 15 years earlier. It was hard to imagine anything less relevant to the contest that they were engaged in, but they had to struggle so hard to find differences, and what they did is they mined that legislative record. When you're a governor, you never have to cast a vote. You might make a lot of statements, but you can always explain away the statements. Uh, and so I, I think those are the two principal factors. And the third one is that you've got a job. You, you, you've got to be there, and you don't control the calendar. Uh, when you're a governor, you can come and go as you please. You, you set the calendar. When you're a senator, an individual senator doesn't set the calendar. Even the majority leader doesn't individually set the calendar. You've got to accommodate 99 other people. So uh, for all of those reasons, I think it's very tough. Is there a fourth reason? And that is that the, the nature of persuasion. And the, and Harry Truman famously said that the, the chief job of a modern president is persuading people to yeah. do what they ought yeah. to do but don't want to do. But a president we think of in the bully pulpit, television, yeah. and all of this. It's a very different kind of persuasion that goes on here, often one-on-one -on -one or behind closed yeah. doors. <clears throat> and combined with that is the whole lingo of the legislative process. I yeah. mean, Dole was criticized for, for talking, yeah. you know, Washingtonese. Inside baseball talk. Precisely. Yeah. And yeah. I wonder if over a period of time that, in fact, is a, is a threat. It, 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 it makes it more difficult. That's right. You do. The better you are at the job, that's right. The more. That's right. You you, you do come to you, you do come to talk in legislative jargon. But I honestly think, while that is a factor, is not the major factor. Yeah. I, I think a big factor is that you come to understand that issues are complex. This is a big country. There are a lot of points of view in this country. There are a lot of different interests. And there are nuances in life. And when you run for president, all of that's a handicap. Because what the presidential campaigns require is clarity, simplicity, understandability, uh, and likability. Uh, and that none of those uh, are helped maybe the likability part to get along with your colleagues, but none of those are helped by experience in the legislative process. I mean, in a sense, 
if you're running for president, you exploit differences. If you're a legislator, you try to narrow them. Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. I got to remember that the next time I give a speech <laughs> okay. on this process. Well, it's all yours. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, now you you come to, uh, in 1981. Bob Dole suddenly finds himself uh, in a majority. Uh, were you on the finance committee at that I time? Uh, I got on the finance committee in '81. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So you were there for the whole the Reagan tax cuts. And, I was. Yeah. And, and there had to have been, beginning with Russell Long, an enormous kind of cultural, uh, you know, tectonic shift yeah. there. What was it like? Well, I thought internally, and then <clears throat> dealing with the White House, and uh, I mean, and, and obviously Dole was not a supply sider. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, uh, two points. First off, I was the most junior of junior members. I was sort of a senator with an asterisk, appointed senator. I had not been elected. And while nobody said to me, that's a stigma, it was very clear in everybody's mind. And it was compounded by the fact that I was widely expected to lose. I was way behind in the polls, and so there is no reason why anybody should have paid any attention to me, and most senators didn't. Uh, so I saw this from way at the far end or way kind of at the bottom end of the uh, uh, political spectrum. Uh, but I thought Senator Dole captured it best when he said it with his great sense of humor <laughs> when he got elected chairman of the finance committee. He said, yeah, but who's going to tell Russell Long? <laughs> he asked the question. Uh, but he handled it well. Uh, How I, did Long? Well, I, you know, I thought they both handled it well. Yeah. I, I, I really do. Uh, Russell is a very engaging guy. A very, uh, 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 like Dole, a great sense of humor, completely different sort of humor. Uh, uh, storyteller? Uh, uh, storyteller? Great storyteller. I mean, Sometimes you had to really listen closely to get the point of the story, but <laughs> he was a great storyteller and, and a very engaging guy. And Senator Dole, of course, had a great sense of humor. So I think both of them yeah. handled it well, but I, but I, I want to make clear and yeah. confess that neither of them consulted with me. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> part of any inner circle at the time. Um, but that was an incredibly eventful period. It was an incredibly yeah. eventful period, and a lot of important legislation uh, was enacted. Describe, because I, I think, again, this is to most people, mm. 95 out of yeah. 100 Americans don't know what the Finance Committee is. Yeah, right. 99 well, out of 100, well, I'd say. <laughs> what it is, what it does. Yeah. What, what is the Finance Committee? Well, the Senate Finance Committee is one of the most important uh, committees of the Congress. It deals not only with taxation, which the name suggests, but it has jurisdiction over hugely important institutions like Medicare, Medicaid, the whole subject of health care falls within its purview, trade issues. It really is at the center uh, of significant issues that the country and the Congress have to deal with. And so being chairman of the Finance Committee is one of the most important, powerful positions that any member of Congress can hold. And, and how did Dole do that job? Uh, he did a great job, uh, I, I must say. And I was a member of the opposition. I didn't agree with everything he did. I didn't agree with all of his issues. I didn't agree with uh, some of the tactics and processes that were followed. But uh, given the fractious nature of the people with whom he was dealing with, given the difficult issues, I, I thought he did a great job at it. Did you have a sense that while he was carrying water for the Reagan White House, it wasn't always a comfortable assignment? Uh, uh, or y yes, of course, uh, uh, that's the case. But uh, look, that's true of everybody who serves in leadership positions. I was the majority leader uh, for two years under a Democratic president, and I didn't agree with everything that the president uh, uh, proposed. So y you do the best you can under circumstances which from your perspective might not be perfect, but you have to keep reminding yourself you're not the president. Uh, and you've got to uh, try hard to influence policy internally. Uh, and then you have a, a, a party responsibility and a public responsibility. I think clearly on fiscal issues uh, it was pretty obvious that Senator Dole uh, uh, wasn't what I would say a zealous uh, uh, supply sider. Uh, and you know with that great sense of humor he could get that across without actually saying that uh, uh, often. But he did a good job for the president and, and he pushed through that 82 uh, 
tax cut. Uh, exactly. Uh, uh, tax seems, increase, I'm sorry. Yeah, I call it a ta ta tax, well, he called the tax equity, the tax equity <laughs> act. Yeah, yeah. Which I thought was pretty good. Nomenclature counts, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I have a theory about that, and I'm not sure this is true, but I, but I think it is. Uh, if you look at President Reagan's speeches, he tended to regard taxes and income taxes as synonymous. Yeah. I, I don't think President Reagan really thought of a tax other than the income tax as a tax. So he could say yeah. and believe that I never raised taxes when in fact he signed a bill that had a huge tax increase. And I think Senator Dole recognized all of that and masterfully pushed through legislation that really did raise some taxes, but was able to persuade the president and others that it really wasn't a tax increase, that it was a tax equity uh, mechanism. So uh, I thought it was a masterful job, both in terms of the legislative process, just getting one of these big tax bills through is a, is a hugely difficult task, and in terms of doing it in a way that didn't rupture relations with the president or with the administration. 82, of course, is also the Social Security yeah. bailout. Yeah. Uh, describe that. I was on. I was not directly involved, uh, as you know. We, we had a commission. Uh, no, the commission was eighty three. I thought. That's that's right. Yeah, the that's commission right. was later yeah. after eighty two. The but, debate had. Yeah. I mean, of course, Democrats had picked up twenty six seats in the House. Yeah, basically that's right. The social Security issue. And, uh, that's right, and we did well in the Senate as well in eighty two. Uh, that's the year that I was elected to, to my first full term, and it's quite clear that. Uh, public sentiment swung away from the administration and toward the Democrats in that election. Uh, and so Social Security was an extremely difficult issue for the Republicans. They've always had uh, kind of a political schizophrenia about it. They, they were obviously strongly opposed to it at the outset. Uh, and, but it became so deeply embedded in American life that politically you couldn't ever stand up and say, I want to abolish Social Security. In fact, I remember in one debate, I got up on the Senate floor and I challenged any Republican senator to come out here right now and say that you want to abolish Social Security. And of course, not one of them came. Uh, uh, so they put them in a tough spot. And the same thing with Medicare. Uh, uh, and so how that was handled was both significant for the country and politically difficult for everyone concerned. And to be frank, it's obvious that some, perhaps many Democrats, tended to exploit it as a political issue because they recognized the vulnerability of the Republicans on it, who it, it wasn't consistent with their theme of small government and government is bad and so forth. Uh, the commission was essential. Uh, the members did an important job, uh, and I've heard both Senator Dole and Senator Moynihan, uh, who were on the commission, describe the encounter that they had, the meeting that they had uh, out on the steps of the Capitol or on a balcony outside the Capitol in which they uh, uh, spoke about the need uh, when it looked like the commission was not going to be able to come up uh, with a compromise, how they talked about the importance of the issue to the country and that they should make a new effort at it, and that did bring uh, a, a resurgence back, and uh, they were able to get it done and uh, got a good vote in the in the in the uh, both the Senate and the House, and I I think it was a, a great service to the nation. And yet, you know, it's interesting. I, I suspect when Dole ran in '96, and for that matter, even '88, I don't think it was a plus. I mean, yeah. it, it ought to have been. In, in demonstrating yeah. the seriousness of purpose and yeah. the ability to get things done. But I think going back to what you said earlier, yeah. the notion of compromising. Yeah. Um, but the problem is politically, wh when you face a potentially catastrophic situation and then you resolve it before it becomes catastrophic, well, nobody knows for sure that it ever would have been a catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, so you, 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 in effect, by doing the right thing, you minimize the impact of your own argument. Well, and it, 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 it were, I mean, historians are enamored of presidents who are great crisis managers. Yeah. 
they're much less inclined to appreciate presidents who avoid a crisis yeah, in the that's first exactly. place. But isn't that true of human nature generally? Sure. Just think of, of, if you go back over a long period of time, the extent to which political leaders will take the most extraordinary risks in time of war. In effect, the future of their nation or state, the, the, of their society may hang in the balance and they'll take extreme risks. But in terms of peaceful outcomes to avoid war, yeah. that risk taking is minimal. There's very little risk taking because until it happens, you can't convince the public of the severity of the situation. After the fact, then it's not difficult to do, but the time may have passed when you can achieve the uh, peaceful result. Have you read McCullough's biography of John Adams? No, I've not. He should, because of course Adams, in effect, sacrificed his presidency doing exactly that. He's put his own party to avoid war with France yeah. in 1800 and was defeated uh, and went home bitter, but with the knowledge that He'd done the right thing. Yeah, he'd done the right thing. Well, you know, he's wider. He's appreciated. Well, I, I've just recently gone through that in a personal sense. It's a digression here yeah. in Northern Ireland, okay. where the two major centrist parties were the ones who created, conducted, and completed the negotiations that led to the end of the conflict, but in the process were overtaken by the less centrist parties in both communities who've now assumed control even though the others, the, 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 the centrists, the more moderates are the ones who got the whole process going. It's, it, it, it's an interesting commentary, but it, it is consistent with the point that you've just made. That, that brings me, I'll, I'll jump ahead yeah. because of course my yeah. You after leaving the Senate, Senator Knowles had some some diplomatic yeah. uh, missions, pretty thankless ones at that. I mean, did yeah. he uh, ask uh, your advice or talk to you about your own experiences before you got involved with the, the Balkans? Or no, no, we didn't discuss that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It wasn't necessary. Look, he knew more than I have in his little <laughs> finger than I ever know about any of this stuff. Now, in '86, of course, uh, yeah. back up. You were surprised by the outcome in '80. Yeah. Were you surprised at all by, by the degree of success you enjoyed on election night? Well, I was very much involved in that. At, yeah. In that cycle, I was the chairman of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee, uh, and uh, uh, I worked at it for pretty nearly two years. Uh, the answer is yes, I was surprised. You, you think that mathematics and human nature are such that if you have a whole lot of separate close elections, that uh, they're not all going to break one way. But in fact, in 80 and in 86, there were a whole lot of close elections. In 1980, the Republicans won almost all of them, and in 86, we won almost all of them. And it's not the outcome you would think rationally would be the case. Uh, I'm not sure of the mathematical explanation for it, but the answer is uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I thought we would regain control of the Senate. We had a lot of good candidates. And it's interesting now that I try to look back on it because President Reagan was still quite popular. The Iran-Contra event did not break until immediately after the election. It was not a factor in the election. Uh, but we had things going for us pretty well in terms of individual candidates, in terms of the national issues, there was no overriding issue either way, and uh, we were lucky. Is it also possible, without naming names, yeah. but that in fact that tidal wave in 1980 brought in some relatively weak yeah. Republican candidates yeah, sure. who might be more vulnerable than uh, Yeah, without commenting on the strength of weakness, sure. the fact is the most difficult time and the period of greatest vulnerability for incumbents is their first re-election. And, and that clearly was the case there. Do you remember what Dole said on the, on the morning after, or when, when you uh, you had uh, played a leading role in transforming him from majority to minority leader? No, I, he, I don't recall that we discussed it. Did he take it in relative good humor? Oh, he took everything in relative good humor. I don't know how he was in private, but yeah. in, uh, w with, with me and other senators at that stage, he took everything in good humor. I, you know, I wonder if you comment on that, because as long as I've known him, you know, people have been coming up to him and saying, I didn't know you were funny. 
I mean, if, you know, if, you, if you'd been like that during the campaign, yeah. I would have voted for you. This discrepancy, it's, it's now largely disappeared. Yeah. But I mean, in earlier in his career, certainly, when he first arrived in the Senate, when he was a pretty often sometimes harsh yeah. partisan figure, um, he's still a partisan. He still likes to win. Yeah. He's still a party man. But, but that whole image seems to have largely evaporated. Uh, I have to tell you, it's one of the reasons why I admire him so much. Uh, I think it is very difficult for any human being to change his way of thinking and acting. And I think the older we get, the more difficult it becomes. Uh, my theory of this, and I've never discussed this with Bob, is that when he started, he was funny, but it, it was more of a sharper edged humor, outwardly directed at times. Uh, gradually, and I don't know whether this was conscious on his part or not, he began to uh, use humor that was more self-deprecating. Uh, uh, nobody could be offended by it. In, in a curious way, he became more funny. Uh, it, it, he, he is just tremendous when he gets before an audience. I have to tell you that, uh, again a digression, but I have a scholarship program in Maine, uh, which I think Bob has created one uh, uh, similar to it in Kansas, and each year we have a big dinner to raise money, and Senator Dole came one year. And I've had lots of senators and other important speakers nobody compared with Dole and he got up and he told one story after another there was a message in it there was some serious comments but always in his first of humor he went on for about 40 minutes he had the audience in stitches and I, I don't know for how months afterward people said oh that was really great that Senator Dole came and I thought about it there was not a single comment or humorous remark to which anybody could take any offense. Nobody's feelings were hurt. Earlier on, I, I think it was a little sharper. He might he might have got a laugh from here, but at the expense of over here. Uh, that, and that ability to communicate and and um, obviously move people. Why do you think it, it didn't translate or doesn't appear to have translated onto the presidential campaign? Well, I think for one thing, uh, he was in a tough spot for the following reason. American presidential campaigns are characterized by two phases. First, you've got to get the nomination. Uh, uh, since the activists in both parties are to the right or left, respectively, of the broad mass of their own party, let alone the general electorate, uh, a Republican candidate has to go to the right, a Democratic candidate has to go to the left, and then they scramble back to get the center because it's clear that the, the center is the dominant position in American political life. I think Bob Dole had the disadvantage of having a primary contest in which he had to move to the right, clearly more than I think he was personally comfortable with, while President Clinton had no primary contest. He occupied the center uh, very skillfully during all the time that Senator Drill was out there, excuse me, seeking the nomination. And so I think by the time they got to the general election campaign, it was very tough to get back to the center. So. Uh, I, I, I think it was very difficult right from the time he got the nomination for, for that reason. Had President Clinton had a primary contest in which he had to go out to the left, I think it would have been a big difference. It's, it's the reverse of the Nixon-McGovern campaign. Uh, uh, I was involved in Senator Muskie's campaign, and I love Senator McGovern. We've been good friends, but he ran as though the purpose was to get the nomination as opposed to win the election. By the time he got the nomination, what he said and done meant that he really couldn't get back to the center in a way that would contest an incumbent president. So it's an awfully tough circumstance and I've always felt that was that election was probably uh, predetermined. The general election was largely predetermined by the, the, the nominating process. Also, it's almost a badge of honor that Dole looked so awkward trying to be something he wasn't. I mean, I, I used to, I was one of those people writing in memos, which he would then leak mm. to the press, uh, saying, you know, you're not, you're not being yourself. I mean, yeah. the thing you have going for you more than anything else is authenticity, a kind of Midwestern, plain spoken, yeah. 
truthfulness. Yeah. And now you're feeding the crocodile yeah. on the right. Yeah. And it never works. Yeah. You don't look like a leader yeah. in doing it. And you know, going out to Hollywood, for example, a famous speech where we went out there and lectured them about their, you know, moral yeah. obligations yeah. and so on and so on. Yeah. And you could you could see the checklist, yeah. you know. And yet in an odd kind of way, he didn't look comfortable doing it. Yeah. He wasn't very he wasn't very good at yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Also, you know, on the question of humor, uh, presidential campaigns inevitably breed restraint. Uh, a, a, it's so risky. Every word is is captured on television and by a gr group of radio and people, and every word is parsed and examined and turned upside down. And I think it it the candidates risk inhibitor is turned on and and I don't think anybody acts quote normally in presidential campaigns because you're so much on stage it's one thing if you get up in a crowd of 500 people maybe even a local radio station and you tell a joke and it doesn't go over it falls flat or comes across the wrong way it's another thing if you're a candidate for president and you do it within 12 hours everybody in the country knows about it and they replay it well, you stop and think historically. You stop and think of the last candidates who, who, who were totally themselves. I mean, there's Barry Goldwater and Adlai Stevenson. Yeah. And admirable as they might be, yeah. that's not much of a... Uh, no, and Howard Dean. Of, and how well, yeah, yeah more recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, I tell you, I'm sympathetic with people who run for office. I, I've been through it myself, and it, it's tough. And it's awful easy for people to criticize, belittle ridicule uh, politicians and as looked as much to be little and ridicule but it takes a lot of courage to get out there and put yourself on the line for and and get the kind of abuse that that everybody gets in this process I want to talk about the uh, well you're becoming mm -hmm. majority leader and, and the relationship you had with Bill and, and in particular uh, the Bush administration yeah. and this shift that's going on in the Republican Party um, in the direction, say, of the new gig, which, is, which would accelerate yeah. and in some ways blow up, some would say blossom, uh, in the Clinton presidency. Um, was Dole comfortable, in your opinion, with, with where his party was evolving? Well, there was, of course, some degree of uh, uh, discomfort between him and President Bush. I was there on the Senate floor when Senator Dole went up and confronted then Vice President Bush, who was at the podium. And uh, uh, it, it was an extraordinary and scene. During the 88, their 88 yeah, campaign. Yeah, during the 88 campaign. Yeah, and he, he w I mean, it was. Uh, and what do you remember he, of that encounter? Well, I. I I remember him. I was standing right there, down on the floor. He walked up and he said something like, uh, "Stop lying about me," or something like that. I don't remember the exact words. I think there's something about Mrs. Dole's trust at that point, and I yeah. mean, it had gotten somehow she. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember the issue, but it was obviously a tense moment. So there was some tension between them, which of course uh, was uh, resolved, although probably not entirely forgotten after the election. But uh, I, I thought he. I thought he did a really good job in a very difficult circumstance because the fact is the Republican Senate caucus was more sharply divided than was the Democratic caucus. It, it, it was. What were the sources of that? Well, I think uh, uh, more ideology. Uh, I, I think Republicans came to power on an sort of an anti-government. Uh, platform. And then when you have to govern, you're kind of in an uncomfortable position. Uh, and and I, I think that there were that bred what I would call two categories, and I don't break it down in business and Christian rights, so I break it down in sort of pragmatists and those who uh, have more ideological zeal. And I Bob was clearly is clearly a pragmatist that he 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 had strong beliefs but he recognized that nobody's going to get a hundred percent of what they want 
and you're al almost always better off taking 60, 70, 80 percent of what you can get and moving on to the next issue. What kind of conservative do you think he is? Well, you know, it's interesting. President Bush used this phrase, compassionate conservative, and I don't think it characterizes him at all. I don't think he ever was, and I certainly don't think he's been one in office. I think Bob Dole is. And I think in part that arises from his personal history. Uh, I can remember clearly the uh, Americans with Disability Act. Uh, he and Tom Harkin were the prime movers. It's obvious that that bill would not have occurred but for Bob Dole. and. This is speculation, and only he would know this, and maybe not even he, but it was seen clear that his interest was in fact, in part at least, derived from his own personal history. And that he, he is able to understand the feelings of people in that position because he himself has been and is in that position. And he's been a powerful advocate, so I, Although I've never heard him use the phrase to describe himself, I think the phrase fits him better than those who have sought to apply it to themselves. I think there's also a little bit of the populist. I mean, the Kansas, you know, there's a Kansas tradition. He grew up dirt poor yeah. in a small town where people really kind of looked out for each other yeah. in the Dust Bowl. Yeah. And I don't think he's ever forgotten where he came from. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, I think that's true. Uh, the, whole, and the jokes about Gucci Goat and, yeah. you know, they'll be shoeless in the morning. I mean, there's almost a delight in, I mean, first of all, he can't stand a stuffed shirt. I mean, pomposity yeah, yeah. in any form. Yeah. And self-importance. Yeah. And yeah. No, I think that's right. I, 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 you know, we're all products of our environment, of our bringing up, of our culture. People may think that they've gone beyond it. But in fact, you, you never really shed who you really are. Sure. And uh, uh, I, I think all of those contribute to it. But, but the, the, the most important thing, I think, in terms of Bob Dole's political makeup, is a pragmatism that is rooted in trying to get something done. Uh, I, I think that Bob's outlook differs from those conservatives who, for whom the government never doing anything is a desirable objective. Uh, and, and I think Bob's conservatism is rooted in you guys, meaning we Democrats, may have tried to do too much. But there are some situations in which there is an appropriate and legitimate role for the government to play. And I think the Americans with Disabilities Action is, is kind of a metaphor for that attitude. Can, can you kind of walk us through that? I mean, how, I mean, maybe that's a great case study uh, of whatever Dole, however Dole operates. I mean, again, getting back to this notion, I mean, I've known him for 30 years and work with him on their yeah. autobiography. Yeah. And it was very frustrating. I could I never felt I could get in an anecdotal way or you know, <coughs> to understand what he does. Well, I, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what he does, and yeah. I'll, I'll do it in an anecdotal way. Yeah. <clears throat> you meet, and most people meet in life, some who have a natural talent for discerning certain things. Let's take real estate. Uh, how many of us say, oh God, I wish I'd bought that house, I wish I'd bought that apartment, I wish I'd bought that lot. And yet there are some people in this country who, with limited education, limited worldly knowledge, just have an act. They can say, that piece of property is going to be worth 10 times its current value in 10 years, and that one is not going to be. They just understand it and know it. The phrase we use in Maine, it's in their bones. Bob Dole's great talent as a legislator is that it was in his bones to figure out where the point was that two competing positions could be reconciled. If you had 10 fingers and you brought them together so that only the thumbs overlap, he knew where that point was. He knew the phrase. He wasn't a master at getting up and giving 
the greatest speech on uh, the philosophical foundations of the legislation. He wasn't a master at writing down language, but he had the darndest knack for figuring out, I hear this guy, I hear that guy, and here's where the two of them can come together. Uh, and I, I guess I don't think it is pr solely a product of legislative experience. There, I think there are people who've been in the Congress even longer than Bob was who had no such talent whatsoever. They knew their position and they knew the other guy's position and that's all it was. And there was something about him because I saw this over and over again. I saw it in dealings with him uh, where he just could figure that out had a knack for it. As I said, I'll repeat the phrase, it was in his bones. And that's what made him such an effective legislator. It's a psychological gift in some ways. Well, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, uh, people said it's intuitive. Yeah. Uh, uh, my own view is it, it represents both an understanding of the issues and an understanding of the people. And they're not the same thing. Uh, uh, s some of the people with whom Bob and I served in Congress knew every issue up and down and back and forth and sort of could rattle it off like reading a dictionary or encyclopedia, but they didn't know anything about psychology and dealing with people. And there were others who were just the reverse. Uh, I, I think that there are very few who kind of had the knack of both, who understood both the issue, what was important, I don't think Bob ever sat down and read these 500-page bills. I think someone told him what the issues were. He understood where the key points were. He understood the people very well. That last point is fascinating because presumably you'd have to spend time getting to know people in order to have that kind of instinctive yeah. Uh, yeah. sense. You do. Of, you and, do. And, and, and is that he did. That's part of the job. He did, yeah. That's part of the job. You deal with people all the time. As I said, I, and when I tell this to people, they think it's kind of foolish, but uh, this business of sitting down at lunch or dinner with these guys in a situation where you can be as candid as politicians ever can be uh, with others like them. There, there's this small room. I don't know if you've ever been in there. It's the, called the Senator's Dining Room. Uh, it, when you walk in, there's a buffet on your left and there's a large table in front of you. The Republicans tended to sit in there at lunchtime. Then in the, in the far room uh, there's a, a, a so series of slightly smaller tables where the Democrats used to sit. That was at the lunchtime. Uh, at dinner time, Bob and I used to come in, and I don't know how long the practice went on or whether it started, but we would come in and sit together sort of in the big table in what was called the Republicans' room, and people would come in and join us. And, you know, you'd sit there for an hour and a half, two hours, shooting the breeze. You, you might discuss an issue, you might not. You might talk about things that are relevant that it might not. I tell you, it made a huge difference. It made a huge difference in getting to know people. We get to know, not always good what you learn, <laughs> get to know a lot of things that weren't so good about people, but also a lot of good things. And because, first I think, his personal history, I mean the guy was a hero, people kind of looked up to him. I know I looked up to him, I admired him, yeah. what he'd been through in his life and the determination that he'd had. Secondly, because of his sense of humor. Third, because of the point you made, his plain spokenness, there is, a, there is zero pomposity, artifice about Bob. I mean, whatever, anybody who doesn't like him, whatever criticism they have, that's not a criticism. I mean, he is who he is, that's it. Uh, I, so I think people tended to like him uh, as a person for all those reasons, and that enabled him to get to know and understand people, I think, in a, in a very good way. And he had a lot of good staff people, too. Don't underestimate that uh, in, the, uh, in, in the leadership yeah, position. How, how important that is. Oh, it's really important uh, because you can't you you can't speak with 50 senators. Let's assume 50-50 split. You can't speak with 50 senators every hour. You, you, you're making decisions on the go all the time. He's negotiating with me, and he makes a deal with me. Now he's got to get it out to 50 senators, and some of them aren't going to like it. Uh, uh, I encountered that a lot. I would get a lot of flack. Well, wh why'd you do that? You didn't. You 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 sacrificed my position or something. So you need a bunch of good aides, and he had them to get out, talk to people, 
uh, explain things to them, massage them a little bit, particularly the ones who weren't too happy. I made it a point when I was leader, when I reached an agreement that I knew a lot of people wouldn't like, is I kind of took the ones who would be least pleased and said, I'll deal with them, and I'd have the staff guys go around and talk to everybody else. The ones who would be happy were easy, the ones in the middle you needed an explanation, the ones who needed uh, uh, persuasion, I kind of took those myself. The uh, 92, uh, no, well, no, the 90 budget deal. No. Paint a picture for how, how it came about and what, what his role was. Well, his role was central, uh, as it was in all of these things, because, of course, he was the Republican leader. Uh, that was a tough time. Uh, we'd... I personally had had good relations with President Bush uh, uh, for the first two years. Uh, we passed a lot of important legislation. The Clean Air Act was the best example. Uh, Reagan had been opposed to the whole notion of a Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act. Uh, and we couldn't get anything done on uh, major changes to it. When President Bush took office, he said he believed there should be a major action on clean air, which instantly transformed the debate from whether there should be a bill to what should be in the bill. So we had a very lengthy, difficult, controversial process in which we worked closely. And Senator Dole played a key role in that, where we negotiated various provisions, uh, brought it to the floor, got a compromise, and, and we got a bill, uh, and a good, strong bill. Uh, we all made mistakes in the process. We, I made some on our side. The, the president made some on his side. But it was, but it was really a good result. The relationship uh, uh, turned downward after the '90 election, uh, a variety of reasons. Uh, I always regretted it. Uh, in that circumstance, Bob's role became even more important. Uh, because the communications between the majority and the majority leader and the White House weren't as good as they were before, and so the, the Republican leader's role rose in direct consequence of that. And he really became sort of the, what I would call the middleman, the fulcrum, on which the entire legislative process turned in the Senate. Which also parenthetically suggests that whatever bitterness had taken place in 88 had, had dissipated. I think it had. And and it's... He's also I mean, a good soldier. He, he is a good soldier. And he also, as you pointed out at the outset, is smart enough to know that holding grudges doesn't pay off in the political process. You, you, you do the best you can at the time, you accept the result, and you move on. You, if you're human, you may exhibit flashes of anger, which he did, which a lot of people, almost everybody does at one point or another, but you understand that your self-interest lies in going on to the next issue and dealing with it. And, and he was a good soldier, and he represented the administration very well. And of course, there's the lead up to the uh, Gulf War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, uh, that was also a very controversial period in which he was, in fact, uh, uh, doing the speaking for the administration. One, I remember very clearly uh, one issue. Uh, uh, as you'll recall, uh, in the first Gulf War, in sharp contrast to the second, uh, the administration decided to seek uh, uh, UN uh, support and a broad coalition. Secretary Baker was very actively engaged in it. Uh, and Bob came to me, I can't remember when, but it was prior to the election, probably between Labor Day and November, and said that the, uh, the administration and he felt that it would not be wise to have a vote in the Senate until they got things squared away at the UN, until they were able to build the broadest possible coalition. Would I, as majority leader, agree to that uh, and make no effort to push it to a vote? Uh, I took it up in our caucus. We had a few people who became very angry at me, and I think 
<laughs> are still to this day angry that I thought that was the right position. Uh, uh, we hadn't made a decision on what we should do about the actual conflict. And the question was when we should have that kind of debate and discussion. And I felt that Bob was very persuasive in his presentations to me and to other senators in making the case that you got to give the president the time to put together the best possible coalition. You guys want him to go to the UN, you got to give him a chance to do that. And then there'll be time uh, for a vote later. Now, later on, President Bush agreed to a vote, although he said he wasn't going to be bound by the result, uh, that, that he didn't need it, but he was willing to go ahead. He knew at that time, I think, that he had the votes. And Bob managed it very skillfully. That was a closer vote than people now tend to think. It was about a five-vote margin. Uh, and I thought he handled the whole thing uh, from the president's perspective brilliantly uh, in a very difficult circumstance. Did he take a, uh, go back to the to the budget deal, yeah. which obviously the president took yeah. a lot of heat. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think probably Dole, in his own way, yeah. later on, I think it was held against yeah. him. Yeah. Um, was that a factor at the time? I mean, do, how do people sit around having dug themselves in as, uh, as deeply as Bush in particular had? And Dole is his agent, in effect. Yeah. And mindful of his caucus. Uh, how do you, how well, do you get a, that's a long, that that's a long state? That's a long story. I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to tell you. you I don't, don't want to. I, I, I mean, that, that's. It was a very difficult time, and that, that I think, contributed to the deterioration of relations uh, with the administration. In retrospect, the fact that we were facing a deficit that the administration estimated at $100 billion and the Congressional Budget Office at $150 billion seems like chicken feed compared to what's happened since then. But at the time, we were all shocked by it. It was a big deal. Here we face this deficit and we have to deal with it. And don't take offense at this, or I know Bob wouldn't, but that was a time when Republicans really did believe in balanced budgets. And they yeah. talked about them and it was a big issue and we were all concerned about it. <clears throat> we reached the conclusion that you, you couldn't stop the tremendous increase in the deficit without some form of revenue increase. Yeah, you had to have a combination of spending cuts, we're clearly spending too much, and some tax increases. But President Bush had made this categorical statement at the convention, uh, you know, I'm going to say no, the Democrats are going to come, and I'm going to say no. They're going to come back, they want to raise taxes, I'm going to say no, and I'm going to say read my lips. You remember the statement. And so we knew that it would put us in an impossible political position. So we were able to persuade most of the Democrats to not propose their own budget. Let's wait till the president proposes his. And we got a lot of flack from the press. Well, you have an obligation to present a plan, so forth and so on. But we were able to keep most from doing it. And then uh, uh, the president's budget director, Dick Darman, a very smart guy, uh, very smart, and a good guy. I, li I liked him a lot. I like him now. I remember him coming up and saying to me, well, we got to have a meeting with, with the leadership and the administration. He said, and uh, he said, I think that this, we could end up with a tax increase. I said, well, how are we going to do that? He said, well, it's going to just emerge from the discussion. He made this kind of fluttering motion with his hands, emerge from the discussion. And meantime, the president's chief of staff was saying, oh, well, no, absolutely not. Uh, uh, he said something to the effect. John Sununu? Uh, yeah, he said something to the effect that, uh, well, we, we want to have a discussion, but uh, uh, the, the, the discussion will be that the Democrats are going to come in and ask for tax increase and we're going to say no. <laughs> so it wasn't exactly conducive to having a discussion. So we, uh, we, we were able to kind of hold our ground. We, we went through this long process. I mean, this is a matter of months. This is very, very long, extremely difficult, very, very tough discussions. But finally, 
almost incredibly one day I got a call it was seven o'clock in the morning would I come to the White House and meet with the president and of course I said sure you know the president calls you you're going to go uh, and uh, Foley and Gephardt went with me and we met with uh, President Bush, Governor Sununu, and uh, Dick Darman, and Nick Brady, who was then the Secretary of Treasury. And basically, they agreed to that they would uh, support a tax increase in the process. That, that, that was the discussion. I mean, Tom Foley did most of the talking for us, and uh, uh, Darman did most of the talking for the administration. And I remember Sununu and Darman went out and typed up a statement. The president asked him to go out and they came back. There was one last minute hitch. The statement was a joint statement by the president and congressional leadership. We, I asked the caucus, I said, look, I said, you know, they've already told us, they said publicly they're going to blame any tax increase on us. So I said, this has got to be a statement by the president and we'll go back to the Hill and support it. But, and, and they agreed readily to that, and, and that's the way it happened. I mean, history yeah. was made just like that. I, I, Senator Dole was not in that discussion. I, I honestly don't know what he felt, because I never asked him about the President's decision to do that. Yeah. Uh, we, we've never spoken about it, to the best of my recollection. Uh, but that was the breakthrough, and it, we then had a very difficult time implementing it because uh, many Republicans were very angry about it, particularly on the House side, but including in the Senate. Uh, among them, Newt Gingrich. Newt was angry. I, I remember, I think, Bob Packard, who was then chairman of the Finance Committee, was upset. I remember being down in the White House, we were supposed to walk out to the Rose Garden, and that we couldn't all go out because they were still arguing among themselves about who would actually go out and who, who wouldn't go out. I mean, it wasn't our, wasn't our doing, it wasn't our show, so we didn't, we didn't say anything about it. But it was very tough on everybody. You, you know, you got to get something done. You, you're staring at this terrific deficit. It's impossible to get a solution that's 100% one way or 100% another way. Uh, I, I guess I kind of always felt that Bob was pragmatic enough that he figured this is the right way to do it. Uh, I'm not sure how he felt about the president's making the absolute pledge at the convention. I, I just don't know. I've never discussed it with him. I rather doubt my own mind that had Bob won that nomination, he would have made a comparable statement. Yeah, well, remember the, uh, in fact, uh, the primary, the famous debate for New Hampshire in 88, where Dole came out of Iowa, <coughs> was yeah. ahead of Steve, yeah. was ahead, and um, he refused to sign the, the no tax pledge yeah. on camera, yeah. which is a pretty messy thing to do. It was, yeah. And yeah. arguably, it drew yeah. to his defeat. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. I, what I remember is he always used to joke. He'd int introduce Dick Kepi and himself as the presidents of Iowa. <laughs> that was one of his. That was one of his favorite. I always got a great laugh about it, uh, and of course Gepi also laughed about it. But I, I, I don't know. I never discussed it with him, and, and he, he he would, I'm sure, tell you. But I, I rather doubt he would have made such a categorical pledge, particularly since he knew, having been chairman of the finance committee. Uh, what the fiscal circumstances were, that it really just couldn't be, uh, it, it couldn't be sustained. And that was the message that we got uh, from the president's aides and ultimately uh, from him himself. Yeah. It's interesting, I mean, in retrospect, it was a gutsy thing on Bush's part. Yeah, um, oh, it was. And uh, history it was. has been pretty kind. I, I, I think... Uh, than the electorate. Uh, Foley and Gephardt and I, I think, were surprised when the president said, okay, let's do it. It was sort of, there was a discussion. It wasn't really long. I don't think we were there more than 45 minutes or so. And uh, then when we, uh, uh, then he sent, as I said, he sent Diamond and Sununu out to draft a statement. They came right back. I, it led me to suspect they already had the statement because it only took them a couple of minutes. It wasn't very long. And then when we caucused, they came back and said, well, we, we, this is fine, except we want it to, n not we, I, and make it, you make the statement, and we'll go back. And, and we did. Within five minutes, we, after he put out the statement, we put out our statement in response. But it was a gutsy thing to do. What does that tell you, though, the classic uh, divide between political necessity as encompassed in Peggy Noonan's rhetoric yeah. 
and the need to govern. And when the two clash. Yeah. Well, I think of it, I remember Sharon saying, uh, when he got elected uh, prime minister, I was very deeply involved then because I w was asked to chair a commission in the Middle East by President Clinton, who was announced on election day in 2000. And when I first started, Barack was a prime minister. And while we were there, Sharon got elected. And sometime later, I don't remember the time he Sharon was asked about some change in position. He said the view is a lot different when you're inside than it was when you're outside. Yeah. And it's yeah. true, you, 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 you do what it takes to get elected, but I think you make it a lot tougher if you get elected in a way that makes it difficult or impossible to govern. I think you, you, you gotta try to balance the two. And that's why I've always felt, going way back to Muskie and McGovern's campaign, is that the successful candidates are the men and women who have the vision to put themselves into a general election context when they're seeking a nomination and conduct themselves in a way that sees it as a seamless whole. Obviously with variations and nuances, but simply doesn't say that first we gotta do this, then we'll do that. Uh, it's, all, it's all one steady stream and uh, 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 people shouldn't get into the position where they can't govern once they get elected. Well, there's a couple quick things, yeah. and I'll let you go. One, yeah. uh, obviously, that Bill Clinton comes in in yeah. the beginning of 1993, mm. and uh, you know the wheel turns again for Bill. Yeah. Um, do you have a sense of what that transition was like, and how, how, what kind of relationship? Uh, of course, remember there was the. Uh, well, I think there was a tax or stimulus sub package. Yeah. Uh, first. <laughs> yeah, I remember it very well. Tell us about that. Oh, God, we had an awful time with that. <laughs> the uh, uh, Clinton's package included uh, a major uh, deficit reduction program of uh, tax increases and spending cuts, but it also had this sort of separate element of an immediate stimulus package to spark the economy. Uh, as Which often we now know was actually coming out exactly. of Well I was just going to say as often happens in public policy the circumstances which led to the creation of the stimulus package no longer existed by the time the stimulus package got up to the hill. <clears throat> and it was put together in a careless way not anticipating Republican opposition. And so it gave them targets so inviting to attack, a swimming pool here or something like that, that uh, made it easy for them to attack. So we had the worst doggone time uh, trying to do that, uh, trying to get that thing through, and we never did get it through. In the end, it didn't make any difference. It had no economic effect. It had a political effect, I think, of uh, causing the president the pain of suffering a defeat early. I don't think he really cared much about it, frankly. Uh, uh, a lot of the members of the Congress did. They had a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, uh, and I thought to handle the opposition brilliantly and uh, uh, was able to prevent us from passing it. Uh, then we got on to the main event, which was the budget, and we were able to pass that, uh, uh, even though no Republican voted for it. Uh, fortunately for us, it turned out well, whether because of that or for other factors or some combination, the economy then did extremely well and we were able to point out that we now produce surpluses and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it went on, uh, uh, it went on very well. It was almost a rule reversal between the parties. It was, it was, yeah. It's, it's the old story, when you get in power, you gotta govern. You have responsibilities. You you you, you got to meet them, and we had to deal with the deficit. I wonder if, at some level, Dole was almost envious because he, you know, much of his career was was predicated on the traditional economic notion that deficits are bad, and uh, certainly something he had fought for and paid a price for within his own party. And yet, here comes Bill Clinton and the, and the Democratic majority, who eliminate the deficits, and suddenly it's a topsy turvy world. Well. Of course, it is quite common that 
a, a legislative proposal could be presented by one side and the other side oppose it, but if they had put their label on it first, they would have supported it. I mean, there are many circumstances uh, like that. Uh, I, I can remember very clearly uh, uh, on the health care issue. Uh, uh, Clinton sent a bill up in November of, uh, what would that be, 93. In December, uh, John Chafee, the former Republican senator from uh, Rhode Island, put in a bill that had 20 Republican co-sponsors, including Doe. And it was a good bill. Different from ours, but it was a solid bill. And I had many discussions with Chafee. We were quite good friends, both coming from New England, uh, and, and we get along well personally, about working together to, tr to try to work the bill out. But the opposition to the whole Clinton effort was so strong and so successful that seven months later, when we got to the Finance Committee to mark up a health care bill, we had moved to the center in a vain effort to induce them to compromise. They had moved the other way. And I remember joking to Chafee in the Finance Committee. I said, John, I'm going to introduce your bill as an amendment and force you and Dole and all the Republicans who have sponsored your bill to vote, oh, don't do that. He said, you'll just embarrass us all. And so I didn't do it. I mean, it was just a joke. But what happens is you, you, you adopt the position that, in effect, preempts the other side and, and takes an issue that they want. And all of a sudden, they find themselves arguing against it because you are the one who proposed it. As, in other words, arguing against the sponsor as opposed to legislation. I don't think it would have been a huge stretch for many Republicans, including Bob, to have supported Clinton's package. I think the reverse is true in many circumstances. I don't want to make this sound like a one-way deal. We did the same thing. Democrats have done the same thing when they've been in a minority. But the tax increases were fairly narrowly targeted to those at the very highest income scale. I don't think that ever would have bothered Bob. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the rest of it was sort of general deficit reduction medicine, which I think both parties would have agreed to. Do you have a sense of what the chemistry was initially between Clinton and Dole and, and whether it evolved uh, uh, over, the, over time? I think they got along pretty well. I think they got along pretty well. Uh, it's <laughs> one of his great things about him is what I call his use of the stage whisper. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you two instances because I, I, I want these to be recorded for history. One of them was at the White House where we'd get out and meet with Clinton and uh, traditionally the, the president would, this would be the leadership, there'd be about four or five of us, Dole and I and the the House Speaker and Majority Leader in the House, Minority Leader and sometimes another. Uh, and sort of by custom, at least since I was there, you'd talk for a couple of minutes. You'd, you'd, you'd give your view. Yes, Mr. President, I agree with you. Here's the reasons. No, I don't agree. Here's the reasons. And they'd go around the room. A couple of guys would give very, very long statements. And uh, uh, Dole would get across it was time to go with kind of a stage whisper. Well, uh, we got to get back pretty soon, he'd say to me in a little voice loud enough so everybody could hear and everybody would <laughs> jitter, you know. He, he had a way of, of uh, conveying a message uh, that it was time to go or time to end or something uh, with the so-called stage whisper. Now, the best story of the stage whisper is a little long, but it's really kind of funny. Uh, just prior to Thanksgiving of 2000, President Bush called Dole, myself, and Tom Foley, and Dick Gephardt, and asked us, would we go with him to Saudi Arabia to have Thanksgiving dinner with the troops who are out in the desert in Saudi Arabia? He said, look, I'm not asking anything about the policy. This is about the troops. And so, of course, we all went. We had a long trip over. We had a very long day going to several different, by helicopter, hot, dusty, dirty, sandy, everything else. We got back to Dharan, which is in eastern Saudi Arabia, late at night. Everybody was exhausted and covered with sand and sweaty and dirty. And we were informed that the king of Saudi Arabia was in Jeddah and the other, in the, what is the western part of the country, and would like us to come for a visit. Uh, 
I said, look, I don't want to go. I'm coming back in two weeks with a delegation. I'm going to see the king then. And uh, so I'm against it. We're all tired. You don't know how long it's going to take. No, uh, Foley, Geprando said, no, we, we got to go. It's, you know, out of respect. And of course, they'll write. And so we, we, we flew from Dharan to Jeddah. We, uh, they got us a hotel room, we took a shower. Remember there was only one room, so one bathroom. We had to take our turns taking a shower. <laughs> then we went out to the palace. The, 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 uh, the, 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 the palace is all over the place. This one was in Jeddah. And of course we had to wait for quite a while. We finally come in to see the king. It must have been midnight, maybe one o'clock in the morning. Everybody was really tired by then. And it was like at a table like this. The king was seated at the head of the table, and immediately to his right was Tom Foley, then me, then Bob Dole, and then Bob Michael. I'm sorry, Bob Michael was the other person on the trip. It wasn't at Gephardt. And so this discussion begins. Uh, and uh, uh, the king would say just a few words in Arabic, and then the translator would speak for 15 minutes. And it became clear he was saying, you know, tell him about my last meeting with uh, Saddam Hussein. It was all about Iraq and the problem of Saddam Hussein. Foley was then, had just started a program where he was dieting and exercising and getting up at 5.30 in the morning to exercise. So within about 15 minutes, his head drops on his chest and he's pretty nearly fast asleep. Bob Michael's at the other end. He's fast asleep. So it's basically just Dole and I engaging in this conversation uh, with the king. And the thing goes on and on. It was really long. We were really exhausted. And over on the other side, not at the table, but seated back with several aides to the king, including uh, Prince Banda, who was then the ambassador. So finally, after a while, Dole says in this kind of loud stage whisper, stage whisper uh, uh, w I wonder when this is going to finish. Uh, we, we, are, we, got a, we got a plane waiting for us. We got to get going or something like that in a stage, stage whisper in English, but loud enough so that Banda heard it. Within seconds, Banda jumped up, went over, spoke to the king, and Literally within minutes, the king said, well, thank you very much for coming. So, well, you should go on. So I told Dole, I said, well, first off, I said, I think you are wrong to insist on the meeting. I predicted this would happen. I ended up having you and I have to do all the discussion with them. But I said, thank you very much for bringing it to a conclusion. And I, I, th those are just two instances. But there were many of the type where he, he, he uses this mechanism of a, a, an aside comment that conveys a message and everybody gets it very clearly and acts upon it. Wonderful story. Next yeah. to last question. Did you have a sense of his chemistry with Gingrich? You know, I, I, not much yeah. uh, of a sense. Um, I, I didn't know Gingrich as well then. I do now. I worked as, ch as chairman, co-chairman with him of a commission. I, I don't think it was close. I, I'll put it that way, and I, I don't want to go beyond that. Sure. I don't know, but that's just an impression yeah. uh, uh, yeah. that I have. I think a couple of times, uh, uh, he, he may have made remarks to that effect, but I don't have a yeah. good. I don't have a good sense of that. The uh, finally, so summing up. I mean, if you're, you know, talking to a young person who maybe ten years from now. Who, uh, for whom Bob Dole is a, a name of a Texas. Yeah. What's important to know about Dole? Um, I would say that he was the stereotype of the American Midwesterner. Tall and lanky, uh, plain spoken, very direct. Not a lot of adjectives and adverbs. Uh, he uh, was what I believe to be the true embodiment of the compassionate conservative. Uh, he did have conservative views, uh, uh, socially, politically, uh, and in other respects. Uh, but, and again, I'm repeating now, I think probably based upon his own life experience, had a profound compassion for people who suffered for a variety of reasons. I don't think his, his compassion was limited to those who were specifically disabled, physically disabled or mentally, but 
who were handicapped in any other way by circumstance and so forth. Uh, very pragmatic. Uh, you have, I don't even ever remember him saying, uh, you know, making ideological statements. There, there, there was a, a, a real intention to get things done. Here's a problem, how do you solve it? To me, that's quintessentially American. Uh, I, I, I think Americans, more than anything else, are problem solvers. Uh, people bemoan the lack of knowledge of history, and, and I think that's a correct criticism, but the fact is I've seen in Europe, and specifically in Ireland, how too much knowledge of history can be a burden. Uh, uh, as opposed to a benefit. And so I think Americans are problem solvers. I think one of the reasons for Bob's political success, and he really was a success, didn't get to be elected president, but in every other respect it was a, a success, was that he was quintessentially American and that he is basically a problem solver. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I don't think Bob spent thousands of hours reading the defined details of legislation. He figured out where's the problem and how do you solve it. And, and that's what made him effective in public life because I think it was so representative of what Americans are, what Americans like, and why Americans have been successful. Dan Rosinkowski told me a story once that uh, right before the, uh, the budget negotiations, uh, well, and the shutdown, the government shutdown, yeah. uh, that uh, couldn't call it and want a little inside information on uh, trying to get a leg up on Noel, mm -hmm. how he operates. And, and Rostikowski went on, you know, singing his praises. Yeah. He said, but I tell you, he's the most impatient guy in the universe. And I said, he'll, at some point, he'll agree to almost anything just to get out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, he didn't give or like long speeches. Uh, he wasn't much on kind of what you would call pomp and ceremony. Uh, and, but the truth is, isn't that part of the American character? Uh, uh, you, you're there to get a job done and get a job. To get the job done, it doesn't mean you can't kid around a little bit, you can't tell a joke here or there, and you can't use humor to ease tensions. But the purpose is to get something done. And so, yeah, I think he was impatient in that respect, and, and, uh, but impatient in a good way. <laughs> a little bit of Gary Cooper. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. You know, more Gary Cooper yeah. than, uh, I don't know, than Al yeah. Pacino. Yeah, you know? yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think that's right. Probably more, in, in real terms, more Gary Cooper than Gary Cooper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably yeah. too. Yeah. Hey, Senator, this has been wonderful. I can't thank you enough. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's I've a learned pleasure. a lot. Yeah. This is just marvelous. Well, I, I, I think it's obvious. I think the world of him. Yeah. I, I really do. We, 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 we were good friends. We've been able to maintain that friendship. We worked together in a law firm for a That's long right. time. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, several yeah, years. yeah. And we continue to, to, to work together. Occasionally appear at uh, at functions together. And I, yeah. I, I regard it as one of the uh, highlights of my Senate career in my life that I got to know Bob so well, got to like him, uh, and. Uh, and what is the bipartisan? It's called the uh, Bipartisan Policy Council, which uh, he and Tom Daschle and Howard Baker and I have become affiliated with in an effort to demonstrate that you can have bipartisan solutions to some problems. Uh, uh, Bob and all of us put it at the uh, press conference announcing that we're not, we don't, we're not going to agree on the war in Iraq, for example. There are a lot of things we're not going to agree on, but let's take those things that we think we can agree on that are significant and work on them. Uh, uh, and to me, it's, it's so basic common sense that, uh, that I hope it works out, and we're, we're, we're working at it now. Isn't it frightening, in a sense? That's exactly what the American people say they want yeah. in a president. And yeah. yet, for reasons we discussed, there's something about the way we elect presidents today that tends to make, make it difficult. Well, but don't blame it all on the presidents or the politicians. The public plays a big role in that. Sure. You, you talked about the budget. Let me conclude with the story. This doesn't affect Bob, but yeah, it makes yeah. the point about that. <clears throat> when we were involved in that budget discussion, we were buried with criticism, both sides. Uh, uh, and there was a column that uh, uh, likened us to children in a sandbox throwing sand at each other. And I used to go back to Maine every weekend and hold town meetings. 
And I'll never forget, I went back right during that big budget discussion. And uh, I had a huge crowd, uh, as was often the case, disproportionately elderly. And they, uh, uh, the first guy to get up uh, 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 issued this ringing denunciation of me. We're very disappointed in you, Senator. You're letting us down. You don't represent the people of Maine in this, fighting with the president all the time on this budget. We, we, we the people of Maine, your constituents, want you to get back and solve this. And it was a thunderous round of applause. Then he said, I got one question. He said, what, what are the issues? What are you guys fighting about? He said, we can't figure it out from the paper. So the big issue was Medicare. Medicare cuts. That was a big issue in those discussions. So I get up and I explain that to him. He stood up and he said, well, Senator, he said, you represent us. He said, we want you to get back there and don't give an inch on Medicare. And the crowd erupted in thunderous applause. So I went back. I had two very clear messages. <laughs> settle it, but settle it our way. Yeah. And, and, and so you, you got to be careful in blaming the politicians, the people. Now, the great leaders, like a Bob Dole, are the ones who can reconcile those two tensions, who can take those conflicting positions from their constituents and bring them together in a way that achieves a result that is good substantively and that is politically acceptable. Very nice summation. Yeah. Thank you okay. very much. All right.